Shalom, shalom. This is called I Will Meet You There, a place of holy betrothal. And in this, I'm going to explore some Hebrew jewels hidden in the scriptures and also share a dream. I'd like to encourage and build up my biblical brothers and sisters in Christ by sharing something beautiful the Lord God showed me in his holy scriptures. It's hidden away in Exodus 25. This chapter includes the Lord giving instructions to Moses for the Israelites on how to build the tabernacle, including the offerings of the sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat and the table of bread and also the golden lampstand as well. Miss that out. Um, it's all very prophetic foreshadowing of the Messiah giving us the way to come near a beyond words holy God and you are to construct a mercy seat of pure gold two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide make two cherubim of hammered gold at the ends of the mercy seat one cherub on one end and one on the other all made from one piece of gold and the cherubim are to have wings that spread upward overshadowing the mercy seat the cherubim are to face each other in Hebrew it literally says and it faces each toward its brother looking toward the mercy seat. Set the mercy seat atop the ark and put the testimony that I will give you into the ark and I will meet with you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you about all I command you regarding the Israelites. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord God says, I will meet you there. I've taken the with out because that's been put into the English translation. Here it is in the original Hebrew. Ve'noadti lecha sham. And I will meet you there. In the original Hebrew, there's no word for with, as I've mentioned. It's been added. So I think the original sounds even more intimate. Rather than I will meet with you there, I will meet you there. The word for you in Hebrew here is the masculine singular, meaning the Lord God isn't speaking to all the Israelites, but to Moses or Moshe in Hebrew. His name is from the verb Masha, which means to draw out. As a child, he was drawn out of the waters, which is why he's called Moshe. Exodus 2.10, because out of the water I drew him. I think this foreshadows both the baptism of repentance of a believer, that's going, you know, being drawn out of the water, um, and obviously from a messianic perspective, that's a mikvah, a cleansing bath before events such as marriage. And God drawing out to safety his own children by the Holy Spirit from every nation. Waters often represent nations in the Bible. So this verse is a beautiful foreshadowing to those baptized in the Holy Spirit and drawn out of the worldliness of their nations that God wants to meet them in a special place. And this would make sense biblically, because let me show you what this verb to meet here means. And for this, I'll switch to BibleHub.com, which I highly recommend. Here it is, and I will meet you there. If I click on this strong concordance number, you can see a point, meet, set, betroth. I'm going to click on it take you into a bit more detail about this verb root. I will meet you there to set an appointment for acquiring or designating a wife. <laughs> and you can see in the first use of it in the Bible, that's exactly how it's been used. So meeting in Exodus 25 means agreeing to meet at an appointed place to acquire a wife. It's a betrothal setting. And how does Yeshua, our bridegroom, prepare his bride? Husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Church really means a gathering of believers. It never in the New Testament referred to a building. And gave himself up for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a glorious gathering of believers without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. Ephesians 5. And he's very romantic because he wants to meet his bride to be under his angel's wings, like being under a heavenly golden chupa, a wedding canopy. Now, no pictures can do this justice, but this meeting place above the mercy seat that he describes in Exodus 25 is this place here. 
So what is the mercy seat? Because the mercy seat isn't a seat, nor is it a separate covering of, say, cloth over the ark. It is the pure gold lid over the ark of the covenant, and the angels are wrought from the same continuous piece of gold, very heavenly. And in Hebrew, the word for mercy seat is kaporet. Its root are these three letters, which mean to pardon, release, forgive, to make atonement, covering over, forgetting sins, making reconciliation, to pay the price of a life, to ransom. This caporet is the perfect picture of the Lord Yeshua on the cross, making reconciliation to a holy God for my sins by the sacrifice of his precious blood, so that the one true God of Israel can release me from my sentence for sin. He covers me with himself. And it's the same root used in the phrase, the Day of Atonement, in Hebrew, Yom Kippur, Kippur Kapuret. And I'll share a link in the description on Yeshua hidden in Yom Kippur, if you're interested. Lots of hidden jewels in the Hebrew of the Jewish Messiah hidden in plain sight. Now, we hopefully already know that we can only meet with this holy God by trusting in his atonement alone, paid for us by Yeshua. But it is the exact place that the Lord says, I will meet you there, that makes me cry. Because it is a place I cannot touch on my own or I would die. That's referencing 2 Samuel 6. It is a place so holy, I cannot even begin to imagine being able to meet my beloved there. Except for his paying the price for my life, for my soul, with his blood. Because the place the Father King wants to meet with me to make an appointment with me in order to betroth me to his perfect, pure, holy, beloved son, Yeshua, is on top of the Ark of the Covenant here. I will meet you there above the mercy seat. This lid is the mercy seat. Wow. Wow. How can I, with all my sin, even begin to accept that invitation to meet God there? Yet, one of the first signs of a true conversion is a detesting of sin, a repugnance of things previously done or spoken or watched that now feel like vomit. That is the workings of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. I grieve and my soul is vexed, along with all of my biblical brothers and sisters, by living in a time where now vast swathes of the so-called church want to meet with God, but nowhere near his commandments. Biblically, that makes no sense to God. God even says so in this invitation to meet to betroth. There I will meet you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, and I will speak intimately with you regarding every commandment that I give you. Love, God, hell, truth. All have different definitions in this end time church, and unsurprisingly the world, than the actual Bible defines these words. This technique of deception is exactly what the devil did trying to tempt Yeshua. He misused scripture, Luke 4. Derek Prince, a Bible teacher who's now with the Lord, once said, Different Jesus leads to different spirit, leads to different gospel. As did Paul in Galatians 1, 7-8. Evidently some people are troubling you and trying to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be under a curse. I call it the cut and paste Jesus. It's very toxic and very confusing because churches and people who follow it use much the same language, but in smaller biblical sound bites. Watch them for a while and they avoid the hard truths of the Bible. Ironically, this is not loving. It is loving to warn. Jesus warns us about this in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you workers of lawlessness, wanting the mercy seat, but not wanting to let his commandments get near them. I just want to add the word for new you in Hebrew means uh, everything from knowing intellectually all the way through to a man knowing his wife. So you can often catch it in maybe an old translation when it says that, um, you know, this man in the Bible um, went in and knew his wife and she begat a child. So again, it's bridal. Matthew 7, 14, for small is the gate and constricted is the way leading to life and few are those finding it. And as I was working on this today, the Lord at this specific point was reminding me of a dream my daughter had about 10 years ago when she was nine. It's so prescient for the time we're now in. She dreamt we were on a very narrow old wooden bridge crossing over a wide lake of muddy water. The bridge was extremely narrow, only one person wide and she was walking behind me. The bridge led over the muddy water to the shore where she could see a golden staircase going up into the sky. Often, as we walked carefully over the bridge, the wooden planks wobbled and we steadied ourselves, carefully walking forward one step at a time. Then, in the dream, she saw most people on the bridge giving up. She heard them in the dream say, this is too hard, and they jumped off the narrow bridge into the muddy lake. It was only way steep, so they decided for themselves to go the easy way by walking across the muddy lake to the shore. They still wanted to get to the golden staircase, but when they got to the other shore, she saw that they couldn't get onto the staircase. There was no way onto it. It didn't connect. But they couldn't see that until they got there. She said a few turned back, crossed through the lake and started again at the very beginning of the bridge. But she also felt like they wouldn't make it across in time. This dream is such a clear picture of the false and easy gospels being taught so widely today in so many churches. To not be deceived or confused, I know Yeshua is encouraging me to immerse myself more in his Bible, follow his teachings and be careful who I listen to, to detox regularly from everything but his word. Here are a few verses that have helped me recently. Ephesians 5.15 Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. 1 Timothy 6, 3-4 If anyone teaches another doctrine and disagrees with the sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ and with godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. <clears throat> hmm. Two Timothy three verse one to five. But know this that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. The Lord said to me recently, they have mistaken my silence for my absence. Luke 12, 43 to 46. But suppose that servant says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming. And he begins to beat the maid servants, the, sorry, the men servants and maid servants. This is my note. The ones trying to follow God's actual commandments in the Bible. The actual servants. And to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect and at an hour he does not anticipate. Then he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. This person was a servant. They became an unbeliever. So I want to encourage and build us up, biblical brothers and sisters in Yeshua, with the biblical specifics of 
and I will meet you there. The how, through Yeshua's costly atonement for our sins. Above where? Above the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy, holy place, God determines the place of betrothal. Not mankind, not a church, but only the word of God. That's above where, but under where? Under the hooper of his angel's wings. And the conversation there? The God of the Bible will speak intimately with us about every commandment that he gives us. And the reason? Our father king himself is betrothing a future wife, a holy, pure, cleansed bride, to his beloved son. Enduring to the end on the narrow path may get lonely sometimes as people fall away. But that just pushes us deeper into the arms of our beloved, his Holy Spirit's presence, and more time in his word. One day, Bible brothers and sisters, we will be taken home to his kingdom forever with those who hated the deceit of the easy gospels and thank God for his commandments that humble, warn and crucify our flesh, our sins, our spiritual pride. 1 Thessalonians 5 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your entire spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Hallelujah.